As the year 1860 drew to a close, Savannah, Georgia was a city on the brink of war. This South Atlantic seaport town, built by slaves and wealthy from rice, cotton, and railroads, felt it had much to lose when Northern Republican Abraham Lincoln won the presidency that November. Shortly before Christmas, neighboring South Carolina voted to leave the Union and become an independent nation. The news was met with celebration at a huge rally in Savannah's Johnson Square a few days later. There were uh, you know, bonfires and rockets firing through the air and it, uh, you know, speeches. Uh, orators just uh, uh, making these really fiery speeches. It really stoked everybody up and everything. And uh, uh, it was just an amazing time to be alive. Georgia seemed ready to go to war should the United States military attempt to force South Carolina back into the fold. A huge flag carried during the fevered festivities in Johnson Square demonstrated the Savannians' point of view. And the symbolism here is that South Carolina has been separated from the federal government, symbolized of course by the eagle, and that Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and Georgia are prepared to defend South Carolina should the federal government in any way try to forcefully bring her back into the Union. As the new year began, Georgia bounded headlong towards war. On January 3, 1861, acting on the orders of Georgia Governor Joe Brown, state troops seized Fort Pulaski, a U.S. military facility controlling the entrance to the Savannah River. The fort was just turned over to the Georgia militia without a shot being fired. I think they realized they were marching on a United States Army facility and they were crossing a line. So you might look at the, the moat as their Rubicon. Soon Savannah was a military camp teeming with soldiers from all over the state. Probably there's no city in the Confederacy where you'd be so struck by the military air that pervades everything as here. In the park, if a lady has an escort, it wears a uniform, while in the surroundings of the city, where are encamped the various brigades, you will see the fine essence of soldierly esprit de corps. At 8 a.m. on April 10th, 1861, the rifled guns and mortars of the Federal batteries opened fire on the Confederate artillerymen in Fort Pulaski. Within a matter of hours, the Union rifled guns had pounded seven-foot-deep holes in the fort's brick walls. Even though Pulaski was bristling with more than 40 cannons of its own, they were mostly smoothbores and could not fire accurately far enough to do harm to the Union gunners. It must have been horrifying because as these shells began to hit, they were sinking 18 to 20 inches into the wall. The whole corner of the fort was totally reverberating to the point that it shook some of the cannons off their carriages inside. I mean, it must have been raining death for those men inside. The damage was worse than disheartening. Dismounted cannon lay like logs among the bricks. We fought until the outer wall of two casemates was entirely down while those terrible rifle projectiles had free access to the brick traverse protecting our magazine door. It was only a question of whether we should be blown into the air or not. After enduring a demoralizing 30 hours of bombardment, Olmsted realized there was no chance of survival if he kept up the fight. By that time, he had only a few operating cannons in this fort. Most of the cannons had either been dismounted or were not functional. Uh, and he also had the very significant threat of having a massive supply of gunpowder blowing up in the magazine. He met with his officers. He didn't make a unilateral decision. He met with his officers and they talked about what should they do and they unanimously agreed to surrender the fort. And I think the only alternative was to hold the fort longer and probably risk massive loss of life. One of the most remarkable stories in the entire war follows the life of Susie King Taylor, a young enslaved Savannah woman whose family fled to St. Simon's Island. We know about her life because she wrote the only Civil War memoir authored by an African-American woman. 
Susie married one of the soldiers in the 1st South Carolina and became a laundress for the unit, but she did much more than just wash clothes. Having learned to read in secret slave schools in Savannah, Susie passed her skills on to the soldiers and even learned some soldiering tricks from them in return. I taught a great many of the comrades in Company E to read and write when they were off duty. Nearly all were anxious to learn. I was very happy to know my efforts were successful in camp and also felt grateful for the appreciation of my services. I learned to handle a musket very well while in the regiment and could shoot straight and often hit the target. Above and beyond all else, all human beings, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, this desire, need, want, and will sacrifice in and all for that one very precious commodity called freedom. And no one epitomizes that more than Miss Susie King Taylor. There was one bright spot in the Confederate Savannah Squadron's one-sided struggle against the U.S. Navy, and it came not from the construction of a new warship, but rather from a daring nighttime commando raid against an unsuspecting U.S. Navy vessel, the USS Water Witch. A young Confederate officer, Lieutenant Thomas Pelote, gathered 115 volunteers from the various Confederate ships in the river in the spring of 1864 and set out to capture an enemy vessel. They found their prey in Asaba Sound south of Savannah. We rowed quietly along with muffled oars and now the undefined form of some black mass rising from the water's surface is seen for an instant. We all waited in breathless silence the next flash. It revealed unmistakably the lofty sides of an enemy ship. Now men, the hour has come. The eyes of your country are on you. Mark well what record you leave to history tonight. We are rebels. Give way, boys. Three cheers and board her. Stay down there or I'll cut your damn noses off. The Confederate boarding party had an immediate edge because most of the Union sailors were unwilling to fight. Their enlistment periods had expired, and the Yankees were angry they had not yet been sent home. And when uh, Palote's boarding party came aboard, the officers turned out and fought very valiantly, but very few of the crew did. The officers were really angry about this, and virtually every report they wrote mentioned with feeling the fact that the crew just wouldn't fight. The notable exception was Jeremiah Sills, a free black sailor who refused to stop fighting until the Southerners killed him. Ironically, the single black sailor in the Confederate boarding party, Moses Dallas, the pilot, also lost his life in the struggle. In the end, his sacrifice was for naught. The Confederates were forced to burn the ship to keep her out of enemy hands when Savannah fell to the Union just a few months later and the federal blockade of the Georgia coast remained intact. In a sense, all Savannians were victors in the Civil War because our nation emerged whole and grew stronger than before. But in another sense, we all lost as well, with hopes of independence on one side and hopes for true freedom on the other unrealized, and thousands left physically and psychologically broken. Today, the war serves as a stark warning to never allow this kind of tragedy to occur again.